Great. All right. Hey, uh, want to thank everyone for coming out. Welcome uh, to the CAAA event on this lovely rainy Thursday at a Denny's. Um, uh, really excited. I was going to keep this brief and let Dennis come up and talk. We're going to give a quick, uh, he's going to give a quick talk about Satellite 101 and like to build workplace relationships as a young career person. Um, really excited. I think he's he's got over 20 years in the aerospace industry and a lot of experience. So um, I think he'll have a lot of good things to say about how to kind of navigate your career. Um, and I think that's really valuable as a young professional. Um, I do think that uh, AAA is a really great thing to be involved in. Uh, certainly, at I start, um, but continuing that into uh, being a young professional and continuing to be engaged in AAA, I think is like, a, it's a fantastic choice. I think everyone, please continue to come to these events and stay involved because it's certainly it's how I stay active in the aerospace industry. It's how I get my news. It's how I you know, keep the, your finger on the pulse of what's going on in aerospace. Um, and it's also a great way to connect with a bunch of other like-minded people who love aerospace and who um, are at all the different companies here in LA that uh, LA is such a powerhouse for aerospace companies. So I think it's a really exciting uh, opportunity to be able to come to these things and meet with all these people. Um, so yeah, give it up. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Courtney. Um, so I think the, the first part of this uh, talk is going to be like I said, about how do you build workplace relationships. Um, I'm open to questions if there's anything specific, but if not, I'll just go ahead and talk. So just let me know if you guys have anything, uh, you know, that sparks your interest. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, 20 plus years in the aerospace uh, industry. Uh, I started with the US government in ballistic missile program, submarine based ones. Then I moved on to NASA and hypersonic vehicles. And then I probably spent the bulk of my career with um, in the space industry with TRW and Northrop Grumman. Building satellites, um, I've held a number of different uh, different uh, roles within the company from engineering, technical, to technical management, to functional, to senior management, kind of anything and everything in between. I've kind of had a little uh, hand in it. So I can give you some ideas of what different paths you can take and how you manage those paths and how do you deal with certain people. I would say I was quite fortunate to be able to have worked in an industry in a role of integration and test. What that is, so that is what I like to call an expert at everything, but master of none. Right? We know enough to be dangerous in just about every single subject that it takes to build a satellite, but we are not technically the experts at it. Right? So. We have the system engineers, we have the alignment guys, we have all those guys that are experts, but us test engineers, we know just enough to hold our own and to be dangerous and ask the right questions. How do you build workplace relationships? Um, what I found from a technical perspective, if you're just an engineer starting out, is you look at it as a customer relationship. Everything and every person that you work with is a customer to you, right? Even though you work in the same company, they're a customer because you're providing something to them, right? And back and forth. Then you have to look at what is your value proposition? What value do you provide to your customer? Same thing in any other kind of industry, right? If you have to provide a drawing to the manufacturing group, your drawing? Are you good at your drawing? Do you know what you're doing? Right? And how do you interact with them? You got to treat them like a customer, right? Oh, is it not working? Oh. Okay. So the very first thing is treat everybody that you're working with as a customer. Right? When you do that, you start to change how you work with them and your relationship with them. It's no more of a, I've seen a lot of people try to step over one another like my area is higher than yours so therefore you should listen to what i'm saying but that's not necessarily true because for example you have manufacturing engineers i mean uh, manufacturing technicians that may have 30 40 years of experience and no 
junior engineer or even a semi senior engineer is going to come in and tell him something different, right? Maybe you can to work with each other, but this is where the customer relationship comes in and respect with one another. How you work with different people is based on the task that you're doing. So for example, if you're working with manufacturing people, you interact with them a certain way. When you work with program management people, you interact with them a certain way. When you work with customers, oh boy, you talk to them a definitely a you know separate way, right? People who have been in the industry know, right? We, we keep two separate schedules, one for us and one for the customer. We don't really tell them what's going on, just enough for them to be okay with it. So if you understand what you're, who you're talking to and what they want, then you will give them what they're looking for. And when you do that, they start to look at you as, okay, we can work together. We're on the same page, right? And so when that starts, you start to build up that relationship between all these different groups as a person that they can work with. So as they move on, they come back and say, hey, you know what? This guy or this guy or this person, this you know, girl, she, I can work with them. They were great. They were fantastic. I want them on my team. That's generally how it's going to work in this industry. Unfortunately, that's how it works. If you're good, that's great. But if you can't work with people, they don't want you on their team. I'll, I'll tell you that. I've had to let go some people who are fantastic technically absolutely fantastic technically but nobody wanted them on their team because they couldn't work with anybody I'm like i'm sorry right so remember the main thing is you don't have to be an absolute expert but you have to be able to work with everybody i see some smiles here i know it's difficult to work with everybody <laughs> but sometimes you're just going to have to swallow your pride and just just work with them, all right? Uh, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you some examples, um, difficulties for, for me, um, from a technical standpoint, I had some engineers come up to me and ask, hey, I want to put a hundred fifty on this, it's no bigger than this table here. Like that's 156 triaxial accelerometers, that's like every three inches. I mean, that's on top of everything. You're like, well, that's just what I want for my data. Okay. You know, let's be nice to them. Because <laughs> my guys have to do it. Let's be nice. And you have to slowly just start chipping away at them nicely, right? Start chipping away. Because if we just go straight for the jugular, that walls just go up. No one's going to start listening and you're going to end up nowhere. All right. So you got to be logical and just kind of work with them. And you will see that in every step of the way during your career, every step of the way. That's from a technical standpoint. How do you interact with management, senior management maybe? I don't know if anybody's had that yet. Probably have. <laughs> uh, they're a different, they're a different crowd. They have different expectations. Uh, like I was telling you guys um, earlier, where if you're a junior engineer, this is your time to capitalize on being a junior engineer. Ask any question you want. They won't ever say anything. They will just help you out. If I were to ask it, they would just have a blank stare and look at me. Like, I should know better. So capitalize on what you can right now and learn everything. Ask every question. There's no dumb question right now. Because people have realized, and you'll see later on, that if you ask a question now and it saves them from having to fix something later on, you'd be the hero. Guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed. Because if I have to undo something, that means I have to redo all these tests that I just did. When if you knew it, you should have just said something, just asked a question. Right? I had one guy come up to me and ask, hey, 
we had a panel that was built by by NASA, uh, Ames, and they weren't really they didn't really know how to build space products. They're more aircraft. And so they built a panel for us and everything that came on was with these um, zip ties. And they use these um, harness cables that were too too big for the harness. So all the zip ties had um, stress cracks on the sides, every single one of them. So one of my guys came up to me and said, hey, we need to fix that. You're right, but that isn't our panel. So let's go talk to NASA. Because if that went into Thermovac, every single one of those would have cracked and fell off. And that means I have to go back through Thermovac, which is an extremely expensive test, right? Not even, not just in cost of doing a test, but time. So this is where speak up. It, there's no dumb questions in this industry because one problem that up now, it's probably on the line that you just solved. And by doing that, they start to look at you like, okay, you're being honest. You're not afraid to speak up, right? And this is somebody that I want on my team because I can trust them. Building that trust is paramount, number one. They have to be able to trust you to work on solution trust. And I'll show later on what I mean by trust, right? When you don't have that trust, the job becomes exponentially more difficult. And not only that, but his reputation could take a hit too. We'll see that in a minute as well. Questions so far in terms of, I, I know not everybody works in the space industry. So is there any questions that you guys might have in terms of building relationships that, that you're dealing with now or want to know about? Okay, so the question was, how do you find a mentor um, and kind of work through the awkwardness of looking for a more senior mentor that has a lot of experience? Uh, there's going to be two parts to that one. One is going to end up being luck, number one. Number two is that if your company has a very good mentorship or rotational program, then you get to meet a lot of different people. And what do meet those people, I would say a good portion of them really want to pass on their knowledge because they've been in there for 30, 40 years. They love what they do, most do, and they would love to be able to talk to you and explain and pass their knowledge on. I, I can guarantee you on that one. They want to talk to you. It's just whether or not you want to go ask them. They're not going to come ask you, right? They want you to see whether or not you really want from them. Then they'll come and talk to you because they're very busy, right? If you show your dedication that, hey, I want to learn what you're doing. I'm going to put in the time. They will make the time to teach you, right? But again, there is a bit of luck in that in terms of finding the right person, right? But if you had a good rotational program or you could have an internship program within the company, then at least have you know, kind of a initial list of people to work with, right? That's willing to to teach. So I would say look at those um, opportunities that they might have, like mentoring programs, rotational programs, and so on and so forth. And meet as many people as you can. Talk to as many people as you can, right? Because every single one of them could be a potential mentor for you. I, I've worked with program managers who ended up being my mentor seven years down the line because they remembered that I did well for them. So like, whoa, we're working on a program right now. Why don't you come with me? And then so we go and do proposals together for a little while, right? If you're good, they'll remember you.
Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, speak. Hello. One, two, three. Okay. Uh, so pretty much the the Insegundo teams here <clears throat> have been kind of tied up because of COVID and working remote. I'm in that same trajectory right now, working a lot of my work remotely. And uh, my question is, how do individuals in the space industry, in a particular field like testing, add value to a team here? Um, in you know, in something that's uh, integral for manufacturing, and uh, are there any advices that you took, or uh, any advices that you learned re recently because of you know the remote hybrid environment that we have? Mm -hmm. So this one is very unique. No, no one has really experienced this one before. So what I can tell you is that is that. Although we are in, you know, this COVID hybrid scenario right now, it is going to be up to you to really reach out to other groups. Um, I'll put this right now. Most of the engineering people are introverts. If they don't have to reach out to yeah. you, they won't. Okay. So if you're in a group that forces you to reach out, like integration and test, you have to reach out to them. That's good. Because if you don't, they'll clam up. I don't know. I, he didn't ask for it. He didn't talk to me or anything like that. So my advice to you is right now is that you probably have to reach out more than you had before in the office. You have to call them. You have to set up the meetings. You have to consistently kind of, I would say, before you would run into them at the office or at meetings, you know, but now you actively have to set up something specifically. So you do to go kind of one step extra. It says, oh, I'll see him in a hall, you know, when you were working in an office before. But working with manufacturing from an integration and test perspective, uh, you have to work hand in hand. A lot of these 20 years ago, integration and test and manufacturing were split. There were two separate organizations, and they realized you have to be together in order to work well together. So I'll talk a little bit about it as well when, when I go into Satellite 101, but the reason why you have to work together is that when they pass you something, because you are their customer, you're the next level, right? When they pass you something, first thing you're going to want to know is, what did you give me? Was it built correctly? What's on it? So I know what's on it and what I need to take off. So all of these kind of questions that you need answered, they have to give to you. So if you're upfront, like, hey, I need these things. This is what, this is how we should interact with one another. You set those expectations early in the front, and then you'll have more smooth sailing versus, um, well, they've been here 30 years. They'll know what to give. Oh, you're, you're, you're going to get something you're not going to like, right? So be very specific with them and tell them what you would like to see in your group, because remember, your processes are not necessarily the same as what they need and they follow. So they may give you something that is acceptable in their process, but when you get it, you're like, this doesn't follow our process, this subpar. <laughs> and then so you don't want to get into that kind of he said, she said, you know, kind of a thing. So you want to make sure that your requirements and what they're giving you is is very clear. And so that means lots of meetings, quote unquote, network, making sure, you know, you find the right um, uh, manufacturing engineers that you can work with that gives you the inside information, right, of what's going on. You really have to build a network. If you want to be absolutely successful in your job and you want to move up in the, in the ranks, you have to build a network of people you can trust in all these different organizations. That's absolutely true in, in pretty much anything else, right? People that you can reach out to. 
Hey, you guys are behind. What's going on? I'm going to tell you something, but you didn't hear it from me. That's how you help yourself, right? <laughs> so build those networks, work with the people. It's not spying. It's just, it's, you're helping yourself and helping the company kind of grease the wheels as you kind of go along, right? And, and you'll see this too, is that each organization has competing priorities. When you have competing priorities, they don't necessarily match up to what the customer wants. And if an integration and test, the customer's looking at you, right? Integration and test is the customer at the car, at the, at the uh, car dealer waiting for their car and you have to deliver it. When it's not delivered, look at you, right? So everybody has different priorities. I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, it's great. It was good. I answered your question. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, how do you go negotiating a salary? And uh, how do you know when you negotiate a salary, if you should negotiate or, yeah, do you have any tips for that? Okay. So salary, oh, okay. Let me. Let me go back to my all my years in functional management now. <laughs> um, if you're a junior engineer, um, I would say the the best and easiest way for you to go about doing that, again, is to number one is to show the value of what you bring to the company. It's not necessarily just from a technical standpoint, but it's also, like I said, from a like standpoint he can work with you i like him he fits within our culture of our group right I want this guy right programs like him so then that kind of boosts you up in terms of hey this is a person that maybe we should you know kind of move up you have to look at also what you kind of initially started off as uh, from a salary perspective if you are low and now because California did pass the law that every job now must have a salary range, they used to have it many, many years ago, but they took it away, but now it's back. So now you have some additional, you know, information of where you stand. Uh, a lot of these companies now use, you know, comp ratios where you stand with everybody else in the industry, right? If you're in an 80, how you're really low, right? You should be, you know, in the high 90s, right? If not higher, 100% is pretty much across the board. So kind of give you an idea, you can ask for what is your, what is your uh, comp ratio, right? So you can understand at least where you stand with everybody else. And now you have some information of what the salary band is, at least for the position that you're looking for. Um, approaching the topic of of a salary. If you've been at the company for six months to a year, it's easy to ask them, say, hey, what is the growth path here? And they should be able to tell you that. If they don't tell you that, I'd walk, go find somewhere else. If they cannot tell you that, right? If they can't tell you that, at least try to work with them to say, hey, can we work on a growth path for me? So at least you can see, hey, I'm a level one. Next year, I want to be a level two. And in two years, we're going to get you to level three. So at least you kind of have a mental path of where you are. And at each one of those levels, you definitely should be getting a salary increase, right? And we're not talking a cost of living increase at the end of it. We're talking more than 5%, right? I know it's difficult nowadays, but because there's so much competition that you should be able to easily get it. Right. Like in the last few years, you know, Boeing used to drive their little advertisement trucks through our campus because ours is an open campus. And they're like, hey, we're hiring a Boeing engineers. And I walk by to the next meeting. I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah. So it, it's a it's a cutthroat world for talent. <laughs> so for early career development, I would say talk with them, get a plan of where your progression should go, where you want it to go. And then you'll see exactly where it is. So when you start approaching that path, then you can start coming and say, hey, we talked about this. 
you know, and you are working on the salary increase or adjustments or whatnot that they can work with you on. But work on the plan, your your career plan plan first. So that's the number one important thing. Because once you have that, then it's then it's very easy to say, hey, we're you know, I got promoted. So right, what's the compensation that comes with it? There should be a compensation that comes with it, right? All junior engineers should be getting a compensation. Uh, increase a significant compensation increase unless you came in at an extremely high compa ratio. I've seen people come in six figures straight from school. And if that's the case, it might be a little while before you get an adjustment because you're much higher than everybody else. Right? So you kind of have to look at where you stand. So if you got an extremely good deal coming in, you know, you gotta have to temper your expectations a little bit, unless you did did something absolutely fantastic for the company. Right. Any other questions? Do you want to go straight into one on one? Because there's a lot of what we talked about kind of in here too as well. I'm sure I'll tell you some stories along the way, so I'm sure it'll probably generate a lot of questions as this kind of goes. Okay, so I developed this PowerPoint presentation. This is going to be a whirlwind course. Oh, yes. Um, I think it's okay. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a whirlwind, you know, in an hour, I got to tell you how we build a satellite. So. I'm just going to touch on top level subjects. And if there's something that somebody really wants to learn more about, you know, we can talk with Ken and maybe set up something else specifically about, you know, some other subject. Okay. No, so it's not working. Oh, there. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. There we go. So I'm going to go through some of the main components of a vehicle. Number one is power. How do we power this vehicle and how does it stay powered? Of course, there's two parts of it. Number one is internal, or there are solar panels that everybody is kind of, um, you know, used to. Internal power could be nuclear if it's for a very long mission. Most anything that's around the Earth is going to be solar powered. Um, telescopes, main other you know satellites, and so on and so forth is going to be solar powered. So solar power itself um, very easy. Most everybody has some group that either builds it themselves or they buy it from somebody. Um, Again, Northrop Grumman being one of the very few vertically integrated companies, we can build our own cells. We do build our own cells and our own solar panels as well. Internal power, when you're talking about nuclear, that becomes a little bit more, you know, iffy. Uh, years and years ago, we uh, we did some nuclear powered vehicles, and now we have nuclear waste on our Northrop Grumman's old property that we can't get rid of. Right. So when customers come and say, hey, we want something nuclear powered, ah, everybody kind of cringes a little bit on that one. But that's what the customer wants. And, you know, we'll work with them on that. Propulsion. So propulsion, how do we move? We use thrusters. We have our propellant tanks and we have reaction wheels. Um, well, besides the expert here, Courtney and <laughs> propulsion. Anybody else familiar with any of these terms here? <laughs> okay. So thrusters, of course, you know, depending on which direction and where you're going to is the size, right? We can build in one pounders, five pounders, whatever we need. Propellant tanks depends on the mission as well. Mono, biprop, so on and so forth. Right. We generally want to use, 
we've transitioned mostly, at least at Northrop, transitioned to a monoprop because it's just many, it's me, much easier than having an oxidizer and all this kind of stuff that you have to carry as well, which is why we use hydrazine, right? Hydrazine is one of the, the easy ones. And most people don't even realize that, but within our tanks, there's a pressurized side, and then you have the hydrazine side. You know why we have the pressurized side? Because when you're in space, nothing's pushing it out. So you need that pressure to push the hydrazine out into the reaction, right? So that's why we have the pressurized side as well. And of course, the reaction wheels. To save fuel, and instead of having thrusters in every single direction on your vehicle, a lot of time we put in reaction wheels. So those reaction wheels use, you know, centrifugal force, spins, and so then the vehicle turns direction that we need to, right? So then we have reaction wheels. Right again. Uh, hit the key again. Hit the next. Yeah. Working now. Okay. Uh. Okay. Let's talk about bus structure as we're as we're going. Uh, oh, now it's really gone. Or did you do that? So, so the the bus payload is primarily made out of lightweight honeycomb material, and you can see it's very strong, but it's very lightweight. Okay. Um, that's typical, not necessarily that size all the time, right? Some are one inch, some are half an inch, some are, you know, three inches. So that gives you an idea of the kind of weight to strength ratio that we're really looking at uh, from a bus structure, because every ounce counts, right? Every, everything counts because at the end of the day, our mass property engineer is gonna look at us, go, you're way overweight, fantastic. Where do we cut? <laughs> Okay, well, maybe. Can you, well, I guess maybe you can run it then for me. Can you just hit the next? Can you go back one? Turn it on. Power. Nope. Yeah, I still got the laser pointer. Okay, while we're waiting, is there any questions so far? <laughs>
um, I don't know. I, yeah, you can have a copy of it. Yeah. Okay. Restarting the whole thing. It's it's been majority on the governance side. Yeah, uh, Northrop's not so much a commercial side, so you know, that's that's more your area. <laughs> so ours is ours has been more, you know, either government, military, or NASA. Uh, there's been a few um, that we've done for like um, foreign governments. Uh, we did a couple. We did one for let's see, Korea, and one for Taiwan years ago. But again, still government, right? Not so much commercial. And and you'll see that certain companies are known for certain things. Um, Boeing and Millennium. Well, I mean, it's all Boeing now, but all these other companies, there's commercial companies. And then there's government contractor companies like Northrop is. So when they look at certain groups, for a new satellite, for example, like James Webb. The reason that we got James Webb is because our capabilities is vertical integration. We can build everything. We have our own chip foundry. We can build you know, panels. We can do everything. So from a big telescope flagship kind of a vehicle, they pick us, right? Other companies, like we were talking before, they buy parts and then they put them together. So when there's an issue, they send it back. And so when they send it back, you might have problems, schedule, cost, and so on and so forth. So they're willing to take the risk and pay a little bit more for these kind of companies. So when you do proposals, like smaller companies will say, hey, can we, you know, can we throw in a bid? They're like, no, you don't have the capability. And so the government won't allow them to bid, right? So for like the successor to James Webb, there's only going to be a couple of companies that bid again, right? That's going to be Boeing, Lockheed, and Northrop. For these big, big um, programs, those are only three that pretty much the government is going to allow to bid. Smaller ones, if you have like, you know, smaller, let's say, uh, production line satellites, right? More than likely, Boeing's going to win those because Northrop Grumman is not known as a production powerhouse, right? That's, that's a Boeing thing. But now that, you know, we've bought a couple of others, uh, uh, companies out, we're starting to build that capability. Okay. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Go ahead. I told you. Hi, Professor Shea. Do you want to say hello and say a few words about yourself? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, there we go. Can can people hear me? I'm going to assume you can hear me. Yes, we can uh, hear you. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dr. Jay Shelley. I teach mechanical engineering for Cal State Long Beach, but uh, at the Antelope Valley Engineering Programs in Lancaster, California. But I also work for, in fact, I'm actually an employee of Air Force Research Laboratories at Edwards Air Force Base um, and where I do materials and structures for rocket propulsion and been doing that for 30 plus years more than a, more time than I'm willing to uh, to <laughs> admit to um, okay. but talking about the government side so we're one of the ones who would let the contract to the contractors to build us stuff yes you, you and I were probably up at Edwards at the same time. I used to work at um, Dryden, or oh. used to be called Dryden. 
yeah, up in, yeah. So yeah, we might have been, we might have been together. At oh, some I'm I'm sure we probably have. <laughs> Fantastic, excellent. Um, who who else is online? Uh, Patrick from the Navy. Oh, Patrick, you want to give a quick introduction of yourself? Yeah. Hi, my name is Patrick Plantick. Excuse me, I'm a mission assurance engineer with Millennium Space Systems. I actually just got back to my house. I got out of work late. Um, yeah, so I've been in the space industry for about 11 and a half years. Uh, I was doing quality engineering, quality uh, system management for nine years, a uh, year and a half at Millennium Space Systems. We're working primarily defense department constellations. We do demonstration projects and we're standing up production uh, lines in a small satellite factory now in partnership with Boeing. So uh, very excited for the industry, for the capabilities that smaller companies like Millennium as a subsidiary of Boeing, but others um, are bringing into that national defense marketplace uh, for small satellites and some of the constellations in LEO and NEO, and then some of the operational capabilities in, in geo orbits um, relative to you know, small satellites. All right, fantastic, thank you. Try it again. Oh. Okay. If we can do. Do you just want to run it from the computer then? Yeah. From the laptop? It should be easier. Okay. So it's now this one or? Um, we're at a uh, bus structure number four. It is possible we can yeah try to go back and you select the specific slide start at four or go, you can go to five Slide is huge, so maybe it's it's processed. <laughs> yeah, it's it's probably processing. Okay, well let's uh, we can just go, go from here for first. Um, so multi-layer insulation. This is one of those that uh, a lot of people don't really know about. They're just like, oh, look, it's it's pretty. It's nice and gold. But there's an actual reason for that. Um, I'll pass down. This is multi-layer insulation. Essentially, it's just a blanket. Blanket that, that keeps the vehicle from freezing and getting too hot, right? Um, some of that, so that gold material is actually gold in there. Um, we use a lot of different kind of materials. Some of them is Kapton, some of it's germanium, you know, depending on what exactly the mission needs, that's what we put in there. Um, it's generally not one layer, it's multi-layer, which is why you see multi-layer insulation. You'll, when you look at it, you'll see that it's very similar to like those emergency blankets that, that you get in these kits. It's very thin, but it's very tough. It's very hard to rip. Um, it's a very important component. Without that, the vehicle will not survive. It will freeze like or it will fry, right, from the sun. 
it's a very important piece. And just like your clothes, if you have something that articulates out, and if you make it too tight around that joint, it's not going to open up, right? So we have MLI, MLI designers, which used to be one of my departments, and they would design, they would cut, they would manufacture it, they would, you know, put it on. One of the things that most people don't realize too is that we put vent holes, we cut vents inside the MLI. You guys know why we do that? That's part of the reason, yeah. But you know why from from what? So when we launch from here, it's full of air. When it goes up into space, it's gonna blow out. So we have to put vents in there for the air that's inside captured to vent out. Okay. So that's why we put a lot of these vent holes in there because when we build it down here, it's all full of air. We launch it, gotta escape somewhere. Without ripping all the MLI out because the MLI is either sewn on, taped on, right? Um, electrically welded on. So depending on what you, it could just rip it right off and you just have this flapping piece that could be right in front of your, you know, optical pit and then you're done, right? You got a lot of problems at that point. Uh, let's go to the next one, payloads. So our, our payloads is the main mission, right? This is what everybody is really looking for. Why do we build it? It's for that payload. Cassini payload or from the Hubble payload or for James Webb, right? These are the main reasons that we build this. Everything is built around this, right? It's around that, it's around that major payload. You take James Webb, for example, the whole entire vehicle was built and designed around, of course, the telescope, right? There were parts in there that no one had that we had to develop ourselves. So when people ask why it cost $10 billion, I'll admit some of it is waste, but a lot of it also is because some of this technology doesn't exist, like cryo coolers, cryo coolers for the for the um, for the telescope for the mirrors didn't exist, so we built it and designed it ourselves, and now it's a and now it's a product line, right at Northrop. So we spent a couple of years developing that because it didn't exist. We couldn't buy it from anybody, so we built it ourselves. Okay, uh, next one. Communications. Well, if you can't talk to it, it's pretty much dead. So that's one of our main important areas too, is, you know, you hear downlink, uplink, S-band, all these kind of different kind of antenna terms. That's all it is. It's communication going up, coming down, right? Can you communicate with it? And can it send information and communicate with you? So there's all these different kind of antennas, depending on what the mission is, um, like Cassini, you know, had a lot more antennas than typical. Uh, around the earth or, you know, around uh, the earth, usually it's smaller antennas, you know, maybe one to two feet, three feet in diameter most, right? You really don't have anything that big to transmit back down to earth. Okay, uh, next one, size of vehicles. Most everybody's familiar with large, big, you know, James Webb, Hubble, you know, these flagship NASA, you know, vehicles, but there's also smaller ones like L cross, you know, that goes all the way down to refrigerator size and now CubeSat size, you know, but one of the things that a lot of the designs now that are coming out from a CubeSat perspective is that they're looking at, I can just dump a whole bunch of CubeSats up there and they interlink and work with each other. If one goes dead, the other ones pick up the slack, right? That's part of the design process of using, you know, these CubeSats. But when you use that, that means a lot of it is is destined to be in the scrap. And so then you add more space junk up there. So, you know, there's there's a lot of design considerations when when you're thinking about the size of vehicles. But we can build anything, we can launch anything as long as the rocket can fit it. Right? <laughs> Just like James Webb, if you guys have ever seen the the um, unfolding video of James Webb, it's literally an origami just packed into this little cylinder. It's extremely complicated. It's one of the more complicated ones that we've done. 
I wouldn't say it's the most complicated, but I can't talk about those. So, but you can get a good idea of, you know, the different kind of sizes that we work with. Okay, um, next one, nine. What's the typical subsystems that, that are inside these vehicles? Um, we talked about some of it, like bus structure, uh, the propulsion, reaction wheels, electronics. Um, but there's also a bunch of these black boxes. And these black boxes that we're talking about, like electronic power, EPS, ACS, you know, all of these terminologies that, that you'll get to get to know. I remember when I first started, they gave me two sheets of terminologies, just row upon row upon row of acronyms. <laughs> you got to learn them. It's like fantastic. This is what some of them are, right? Telemetry, tracking command. A lot of it is kind of self explanatory as you read it, but these are the black boxes that pretty much control the vehicle itself power, attitude control, comms, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, next one. We're going to go into satellite integration and test. Um, I kind of focused on this one a little bit because I think that's probably the most exciting um, besides, you know, proposals and manufacturing. I, I think integration and test is probably one of the most exciting parts of building a satellite. Okay, next, next one. Yeah. Thank you. So what do we do? It's like a Lego set. We take all the pieces together that manufacturing gives us and we put it all together. We have to write the instructions too, as well as we go. So the team takes all the parts from manufacturing, from the um, vendors and so on and so forth. And we start writing instructions um, from the drawings and we start putting everything together. We test every piece, we deliver it to the launch site, we put it on a rocket, fire it off. And even after we launch it, we're not done. We have to make sure everything opens. We have to make sure everything functions properly because if it doesn't open, like for example, one of uh, my programs that went off is me and this other mechanical engineer in the control room and they weren't getting the, the, the right telemetry. They're like, something's not opening and you can see the whole control room. Just look at the two mechanical guys. We're like, oh man, we're in trouble now. <laughs> but luckily it wasn't us. We're like, Phew. Okay, uh, next one. Tim. Core concepts. Before we go into the different steps of integration and tests, I want to go through some of the core concepts. And this is some of the things that we kind of talked about earlier about how to be successful. Um, next slide. Picture is worth a thousand words. I can't emphasize this one too much. This right here is going to be your make or break. If you don't understand that drawing, if you don't have the right view to see what's behind that box or what's that underneath that cable, your technician on the floor is going to look at you with a blank stare. What do I do now? Okay. Which is why I say we have to look at different ways of communicating that besides just paper drawings. So we can use augmented virtual reality system, which I pioneered over there, um, because now the designer doesn't have to print out multiple views of that drawing. Just every sheet that he prints out costs a dollar value, right? And so if we have the models downstairs ourselves, we can look at whatever view we want. And we don't have to bother about printing out another one and doing rev control and all this kind of stuff. So pictures, absolutely important. Oh, is that me? I think I did that. Okay, I can do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, instructions. Nothing happens without paperwork. And this isn't just because, you know, we want to be, uh, you know, difficult. Instructions, instructions, instructions. Why do we have instructions? Because the technician on the floor needs to know what the engineer wants done, right? Just by looking at a drawing does not necessarily give you all the steps, right? There are certain things in there that the drawing does not show that the engineer knows needs to be done. You got to have instructions. Not only just for that, 
But if you ever have a problem, which we've had many, many problems before, such as you get a guide up report and the bolt's bad. Where'd you use the bolt? Your torque wrench is bad after calibration. Where'd you use the torque wrench? Go back to your paperwork. Every single, I've had to disassemble a whole entire vehicle the size of a school bus because we had a bad torque wrench. I had to go back and rewrite all the procedures and re-release it just because of that. So that's why we have instructions. Same thing with testing. Testing is a little bit more um, crucial uh, for instructions because you're the test engineer. What do you want them to do? How do you want them to do it, right? You know, you've worked with them in terms of designing this test, but everybody needs those instructions. What are you gonna do? When are you gonna do it? Who was there? Does somebody verify like quality and so on and so forth, right? The customer requires this. When they have their proposals, there's certain things in their proposal that every uh, every company must provide. Cost, quality, paperwork, right? So that they can verify everything. And of course, launch. The importance of instructions and trust. Anybody remember this picture? I've heard about this picture. So when this happened right here, when Noah got tipped over, let me tell you that sent shock waves in our industry. I had to, I had to stand down all of my departments. Essentially, our whole entire campus stood down because our customer required it. Prove to us this will not happen here. We spent almost a week scrubbing in meetings, scrubbing our procedures and everything to prove to our customer that will not ever happen. And you know why this happened? Is because people thought they knew better and didn't listen to the junior guy. So for those who didn't know the whole story, junior guy comes in from a second, from the, fir to, from the first shift. The first shift guy comes in after the second shift and he looks, he goes, hey, these bolts, don't look like they're tightened. So the test conductor says, nah, just go away. We gotta get, we gotta keep going. We gotta keep going. So he asked his test conductor, didn't listen. He went up, he went up and asked his test engineer. They didn't listen to him. Went up, asked the program manager. They didn't listen to him. So he refused to work. I'm not working. He sat out, tipped it over. He was the only guy not fired. Only person not fired or removed from the program. Trust instructions is very, very important. That's why a lot of times when you look at the instructions, you're like, why are we doing this in duplicates? Why are we verifying over and over and over? So that this doesn't happen. This right here cost not just money, but the reputational damage to Lockheed was enormous. Not only that, it's a reputational damage to the big three. Everybody got shut down because of that right there, right? And then everybody was complaining because all of my departments had to prove to each one of our customers that we won't have that same issue. Any questions so far? I thought that was a good shock down. <laughs> nope. Oh, wait, was that you or me? But maybe that's me. Oh, oh wait, it is me. Oh, okay. Okay, so we're going to jump into integration here. Um, we have piece part. Oh, it's essentially piece part um, installation into sub piece parts into subsystems. Then we get subsystems into system level. And then we have flight software development. And then we have um, high fidelity test beds. Again, this is very 10,000 foot level, right? We can break each one of these down and you know, spend days upon days talking about it. High fidelity test beds. Anybody familiar with test beds? With test beds. Why do we do high fidelity test beds? Right? 
do this essentially to test all the components, electrical components, before we install it onto the vehicle. We use it for troubleshooting as well, right? Something goes wrong that we installed in a vehicle. We try not to use the vehicle too much because there's a cycle limit. The more life we use out of that, the less life it has up there. So we do it on the test bed. All of these test beds are engineering units, meaning that they can be qu flight qualified if necessary, but they are as close to flight as possible because we want it to be as close as possible so that we can replicate any kind of errors that are on the vehicle, the real vehicle downstairs. Okay. So that's why we have high fidelity test bed. Every single cable is the same length, same size, same manufacturer as the real one that's on the vehicle. Right, because if you have a different length and you have signal loss, it could be due to length. So we need everything to be exactly the same, which is why it's a high fidelity test bed. Previously, years and years ago, we didn't do that. We just had any kind of cable in there. So when you're trying to troubleshoot, you, you don't really know exactly just kind of a general area. So that's why we, we transitioned to high fidelity test beds. So the main part of integration, um, before we get into that, I want to talk about MGSE, mechanical ground support equipment. So when we had test beds, um, we had a lot of EGSE, electrical ground support equipment. And then this is stuff that essentially is support equipment that's needed to either test the uh, software or equipment that's required to mechanically integrate uh, the vehicle. Um, everything here in James Webb, we spent about $500 million building support equipment, mechanical support equipment, $500 million, because it's a very unique vehicle. Now, if we were building 50 James Webb, of course, you know, the cost goes down, but because it was one of a kind, it cost that much. Um, for, is that me? Okay. Um, for mechanical and electric integration, we install all the components, um, propulsion, um, cables and harness, all the black boxes, uh, solar array, uh, and we start testing everything. Uh, we do initial testing, like uh, harness pin checkouts, thermal component installation, propulsion system uh, pressurizations, and then uh, the electrical guys um, start writing their software ATS, which is automated test sequences to run their test to make sure that their software is running the mechanical parts correctly. Mechanical and electrical testing. So I'll, I'll pass this out. These are, you, you can take them out and take a look at it. These are um, ordnance um, firing pins. And you can see at the screws, there's a lot of residue from where it fired. So that's not the actual cartridge itself, it's, that's just the firing um, pin. Uh, mechanical electrical testing, you must have coordination, absolute coordination. And we've had problems where the paperwork was not correct. So the electrical guys in a control room were running their ATS sequences and the mechanical guys weren't ready and they, rotate it something that they shouldn't have and we overstressed. So this is where mechanical electrical testing must absolutely be in coordination with one another because you will damage and you will break something. And when we talk about breaking something, it is in $50,000, right? We're in the millions of dollars and that's just for the product. That doesn't include cost and um, schedule time, which again has a dollar value to it as well. Alignments, anybody familiar with alignments? No? Okay. So I like alignments. They used to be one of my departments. I like those guys, really smart guys. Uh, so what are alignments? Everything that we put on the vehicle, we have to know the position of it, right? If it's a optical unit, star trackers, that gives us the position of the vehicle by looking at the stars. Everything pretty much has a mirrored cube on it and a specific location. 
And our guys tie those cubes all the way back to the master cube that's on the bus. And why do we do that? Because during testing, during launch, or whatever happens, if something gets knocked out of place or something doesn't look right, we can look back to see did something mechanically shift or is it software, right? Such as, hey, the spacecraft should be facing the sun because our star trackers are looking at you know these, but it's not. It's looking at this and we're not at the sun. What's going on? So first things first, alignment guys are up. Look at your data, what's going on, what's happening. We have to start going back. So this is where all the instruction starts to come into play, right? Reaction wheel polarity testing. Um, again, did we plug it in correctly? Is it spinning in the right direction <laughs> that we expect it to? And again, if you find problems later down the line and you have to disconnect something, you have to redo all the tests. And if you don't redo all the tests, you're going to have to sit down with your customer and prove to them that you didn't mess it up because you disconnected it. So the program manager will choose one pain or the other pain, but it's going to be painful either way. I speak with passion because I've been in too many of those. Okay, mechanical testing. All different kind of tests. Propulsion testing. I enjoy propulsion testing, actually. It's quite fun. <laughs> um, a little bit dangerous, but, you know, not, not too much. As long as you're not doing, you know, maximum operating pressure testing, so on and so forth. But it's okay. But there's solar, solar panel deployments, de uh, other kind of deployments, clamp bands, alignments, ordnance, reaction wheels. Pass fail criteria. This is a lot of where we talk about when you talk with your system engineers, did they tell you what they're expecting? Because they have to prove it to the customer, right? The system engineering are saying, hey, customer, here's all the data. This is what the test engineers gave me. Is this correct? You don't have that pass fail criteria. What are you testing to? Right? So we absolutely must have this pass fail criteria. If that pass fail criteria comes later after you did the test, that's more cost, more money, more schedule, more time. Right? So absolutely talk with the people that are involved in your operation. And we kind of talked about multi-layer um, insulation here, so I won't spend too much time on it, but you can see um, this was one of my departments as well, where you know they would get rolls of the material, they'll cut it out, they'll weld it, tape it, sew it, whatever is required right here, design it, and then they'll install it themselves as well. So, any questions so far? Absolutely. So those are environmental tests. I'll get to that in a minute. Absolutely. Oh, it's one too many. Okay. Um, payload integration. This is one of the big milestones in just about every program, right? Just the reason why you built this, this vehicle is the payload integration. Some vehicles have just like James Webb, just one payload. Um, some vehicles like the NASA um, Earth Observatory systems has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine to 11 payloads. So it, it, it depends on the vehicle that, that, you're, that you're building. But payloads, Payloads are not necessarily built by the company who is putting this whole thing together. Most of the time, it's not. It's built by somebody else. So why do we care? We have to make sure when you talk to your customer, your vendors, that your source control drawings, they have the correct mounting locations, they have the correct um, dimensions, they know everything that's coming in so that when it gets delivered to you, it fits onto the vehicle. Okay. Now, I've had uh, an experience here where uh, well, no one here is from Raytheon, so I'm going to 
go after Raytheon a little bit here. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm going to go after Raytheon a little bit here. <laughs> but Raytheon sent a payload to us, and we're about ready to put it on the bird. So I was actually down on the floor, and my my uh, my technicians were down with me, and they opened up the the container. Nice plastic bag, and then we all looked at it. And I told my team, step back. We're not going to touch this thing. So you know what they put in there? So the supports to hold the bag so that it doesn't lay on, on top of the payload was plastic. So you got plastic upon plastic that they're going to pull off. You, that, that's on you guys. <laughs> We're not going to, you know, ESD charge this thing. So have at it. <laughs> like Whatever you need, we're here to support you, but that, that one's on you, <laughs> right? So this is where we have to be very um, coordinated with our vendors of what's coming. I remember um, I was the payload lead and I had two vendors from the Netherlands. So I had to get up at four in the morning and have weekly meetings with them to make sure they understood what they're getting here and what they're bringing, what's allowed here and what's not allowed in our facility, right? Because it might be okay for them, but you know that might be a no-go, you know, uh, material for us. For example, right? No tin, no zinc in our material in in any of our facilities, and I'll get to get to why in, in a second. Oh, did I go all the way back? Yeah, we actually. It is. Okay, good break for questions. <laughs> any, any, any questions so far? Yes. No, that's uh, so every vehicle does have thermal components. So that's in the very beginning when when we um, that's one of the first things that we generally install on panels or on a bus is all those thermal components, heaters, thermistors, thermostats, so on and so forth that controls the, the temperature um, inside the vehicle. So we do install all of that. Um, the mechanical guys do it and there's a lot of different processes that we go about doing it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with high pot testing. Okay, no. So, so essentially what they do is um, when we get these um, uh, heater strips, they abrade it. So when they abrade it, we have.
can can you guys hear me now? Oh, there we go. Okay, we were muted. <laughs> okay, so this right here, um, the 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 picture with all the stacks of speakers. Uh, we've started contracting with all of these concert going companies that have all these speakers, you know, in these big venues, and we've figured out that that's also another low cost, effective way to do our acoustic testing as well is by stacking the speakers in specific, you know, locations and, and areas. And as long as the speakers themselves have the right kind of power, then it'll work. And we've done this a couple of times. So that works in a pinch, especially if you don't have a dedicated facility like this. Um, years ago, um, we didn't have this kind of facility. So we used to go down to Boeing. And so that was kind of a sore point as them being a competitor. So we built two. <laughs> um, another part of dynamic uh, is the not just the acoustic, but we shake everything, right? We put it on on a vibe table and we shake it. If anybody has seen it, if you guys seen a vibration test on it, it's extremely violent. I mean, we put a whole vehicle on there and the thing is shaking so much. You're sitting there like something had to have broken something had i mean it's just going like crazy it's like the stuff you see in like a hurricane i mean it's just and it's just everything slapping around and just it's extremely violent but most of these tests right here is really a workmanship test is to see that what we did and how we did it nothing fell apart during launch so you can look at dynamic tests as kind of a workmanship test. There's a lot of dynamic testing on piece parts before it gets to us, like on black boxes. We do a lot of dynamic testing for the manufacturing groups as well. But um, that's for their qualification, right, before it gets to us. So that's dynamic testing. Thermal vacuum testing. Okay, so this is a big one. Um, thermal vac chambers are very expensive, and those are few and far between. Um, NASA has probably the largest one, um, and the others are pretty much, you know, by the big three, right? Big three companies, Boeing, you know, Lockheed, and, and Northrop. What do we do in there? We put the vehicle in there. We suck out all the air. We put, you know, cooling panels, heating panels in there, and we simulate the environment in space that it's going to see. Right. So as it goes around, sometimes it faces certain faces, uh, certain part of the vehicle faces the sun. Some of it is in the dark side of the earth. So it's hot, cold, hot, cold. And so we try to uh, simulate that cycle as it goes up and down in terms of temperature. And as everybody knows, when you cycle temperature up and down, materials don't like that. Right. Materials properties start to start to do weird things. So for example, tin and zinc band, reason being in thermal vac chambers for the hot and cold, it begins to whisker. As it whiskers, it hits a circuit, you're done, right? You shorted something. So that's why like tin and, and that kind of stuff, absolutely not allowed within facility, within most of these facilities. A lot of our, um, a lot of our uh, 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 buyers, uh, they always ask that question. They scan for that. They have um, they have scanners, material scanners that can hit a material and it gives a list of what's on there, right? So we can make sure that none of that accidentally gets into our supply chain and onto a vehicle, which is why it's very important that when we buy these parts, we buy it from certified vendors that are actually space qualified. And those are few and far between. Now, I'll give you an example too. Um, one of our buyers bought a cable harness from somebody, I don't know where, and we weren't sure, so we baked it out to see the outgassing. That thing was not space qualified. So it outgassed so much that it contaminated a whole chamber, and we baked that chamber out for 24 seven for seven days straight, just to that's And if we put that on the vehicle, it would have went all over the optics of the vehicle, and that, that would have been the end of that. Right. So that's why it's very important that we understand where these parts are coming from. Um, one other uh, story I'll give you too in, in here is we got a panel from a vendor 
Um, we bought it from them because it was cheaper, we thought. And that panel came to us all nice and pristine and beautiful. When we started putting components down, for some reason, we could not get a resistance reading. But we tried and we tried. And we're sitting here we're like, come on, this is the most basic thing. How can we not get this? Took us a couple of days to figure it out. The vendor clear anodized it and didn't tell us. So there was a film layer right on top and they didn't tell us. We didn't say to put do anything, but they did it as part of their process. So they clear anodized it and we lost four days trying to figure that out. So that's why it's very important to know who your vendors are. EMI EMC testing. Oh, I actually quite like this one too. Anybody familiar with EMI EMC? Well, century, essentially, it's interference, right? Your cell phones, you're driving through something, static, all this is interference. What we're checking out over here is that the payloads, the electronic items, everything that's built up in there, when we turn everything on, is it going to interfere with each other? Right? And it better not interfere with each other. If it is, then we designed it wrong. Because every single cable that we use is shielded, right? So you can't just go down to, you know, to Best Buy's or wherever and just get a cable. Every single one of these are shielded, right? To a specific level, depending on what the, what the mission is, whether it's in low earth orbit, high earth orbit, because each orbit has different radiation levels, right? So then we have to get different kind of cabling. But EMI, EMC testing, oh boy, this is, so <laughs> I love the story because the amount of energy that's being pumped in here is so high that if you if we don't have the correct kind of foam around here, we'll set it on fire and we've done it before, right? We've burnt, you'll, you'll see when you walk into some of these chambers, they're, they're, they're not nice and blue. All the tips are black, right? Because of the kind of energy that's, being pumped in there. And if we set a fire in there, which we have before, we have these, well, we used to have these deluge systems that's fired twice before, once during when I was building the factory. It fired twice. I mean, when it fires, it dumps about an Olympic size amount of water, Olympic size pool of water into the chamber. So when we did that, that was a $7 million rebuild on that chamber. So we try not to punch too much energy in there. Oh, did I just lose? Oh. So EMI, EMC, um, that can also be done in a tent in a shielded tent, which we've done previously before, uh, depending on what you're really looking at trying to do. Um, if you're in a tent, you're just really looking to try to pick up the signals. When you're in that kind of a chamber, you're actually firing signals right at the vehicle. So it, it's it's a slightly different kind of test on what you're really uh, looking for. So we've built um, frames and, you know, this whole entire shielded tent, you know, inside our high bay and, you know, the EM, EMI EMC guys goes in there and, you know, he's like, everybody out, no cell phones, no nothing, nothing that can generate any kind of, you know, radio waves, everybody out. So we have to clear out. Are we back on? Yeah, we're back on. Uh, let me go back one. I'm not sure where we're at. Oh yeah, maybe that is right. Okay. So after all of the in environmental testing, that I, put, I pressed one too far. Yeah, that 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 was me. Yeah, that was me. Sorry, this this PowerPoint. I mean, it's it's huge. It's a huge file. It, it's an enormous file. Ooh, wow. 
going all the way back. Can we go forward? Yeah. Uh, go one more. Come on, one more. Go to the next one. Okay. So after we're done with all of our testing, um, one thing I didn't mention is we do a number of what we call CPTs, comprehensive performance tests, um, throughout the build of the vehicle, um, all the way up to final preps and containerization. That's essentially at each um, each level of the build, determining where we're at. We make sure that everything works with each other, right? Um, environmental after environmental is usually one of the last CPTs that we generally do, full CPTs that we do to make sure that during environmental, nothing happened to the vehicle, right? So we do a full comprehensive CPT um, to make sure everything checks out. And then once it does, then we go into final preps and containerization. Yeah, let's go next. There we go. So one of the things we do here is mass properties. We want to weigh it to make sure that when we give the uh, when we give the rocket guys the exact weight and the CG of the vehicle, they can plug it into the rocket. We don't want it tilting off and going off somewhere else because it's too heavy on one side or whatnot. So that is an absolutely important thing to do is the mass properties right here. And of course, Final preps is to make sure that whatever that we're putting on that doesn't need to fly gets tagged to be removed and everything that needs to go on is tagged to be installed at a later time. So this is very important, red tag, green tag. So in this industry, red tag, green tag is one of the very important things. When you do this, the customer is going to be right over your shoulder like a hawk, along with all of their QA people. Oh, okay. I think it was green okay. Oh, okay. I think it's all right. Perfect. All right. So containerization. Ah. What does containerization in, involve? Um, most people don't realize that when we go off site, it's pretty much we take 80% of our factory with us. So it's not a small operation. We take everybody and everything with us, anything that we might possibly need. If we go to that launch site, if you have like multiple launches of the same thing from the same location, then you don't have to bring as much because you just leave the stuff down there. But if you're one off then you bring everything with you and bring it all back. So um, I used to have the logistical group as well. So when we do containerization, you know, either it's a container that we built or the customer provides for us. Right. We pack everything in, we put the vehicle inside. And we absolutely have to be critical with this too, because if we're driving, flying, putting it on a boat like James Webb was, we have to work with Air Force, the Navy, local, um, you know, police for transportation. Love this picture. Um, if anybody's been really involved with a launch campaign, ha have you been involved with the launch campaign? Okay. Launch campaigns, one of the most nerve wracking, but one of the most exciting times um, for, for this vehicle. The customer has their brand new shiny toy ready to go. All we have to do is get it there without breaking it. Okay. So, oh. Uh, so when we oh wait okay. uh, plus thirty two okay all right well we'll stay here for for a second um I'll give you a story here um. 
one of our programs, we always fly it on, on a C5. So the LAX, we have a whole entire convoy that goes out to LAX and we load our, our um, container inside. Um, we, we do what we call trailblazers. Uh, if we've never done it before, we go out, we fly the, the, um, the plane in, we take the container out there empty and we try it, we fit it, everybody understands the weights, the load master understands what it is so that when we do it for real, we, we've got it down. Round trip flight right here for this for the C5 is a million dollars round trip. So that's why if we used another system to simulate this, like in a VR world that has physics engines and we're comfortable with and a customer likes it, then we can do as many kind many um, trailblazers as we want without costing a million dollars per flight, round trip flight, right? Things like that. But back to launch campaign and shipping. So launch facilities. Um, launch facilities are, we go anywhere. In, in, this, in this business, we go anywhere. Typically, it is Vandenberg Air Force Base, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, well, James Webb is in, you know, Guiana, French Guiana. But we go anywhere our customer wants to launch it from. We've been to Korea, we've been to Taiwan, so on and so forth, right? Doesn't matter how it gets there, by ship, plane, train, truck. You've done it. Now uh, I'll give you a quick, uh, <laughs> quick story on a truck. So uh, we were shipping a, a vehicle up to Vandenberg Air Force Base, um, not too far from here, a couple of hours, and I get a call at three in the morning. Hey, we hit a guardrail. We punctured the container. Fantastic. Okay, roll out of bed, start driving up there at three thirty in the morning. Start heading up there somewhere around Ojai. <laughs> they they hit the guardrail. Lucky it was a double hull container, so they only punctured the first one. But you can see anything could happen, right? Mm -hmm. So as a test engineer, you're always on call, no matter what. So if you enjoy that kind of stuff, that's just the job for you. Shipping logistics goes back to who owns what, where are we going, how many people are going, what does that facility have. Do we have the necessary transportation documents? You know, where's everybody staying? Do you have the necessary equipment? Do they have the capacity? So on and so forth, right? This is a logistical nightmare. You bring, I don't know, 50, 60, 150 people out there. Accommodations, you gotta get, you know, if they're working on a classified program, you gotta get their story straight. They can say this, they can't say that, okay? So all of this, shipping logistics, cost money. So when people say, why does it cost so much? This is part of the reason. Plus, one more thing on why it costs so much, I'll give you an example. If you were in space, I asked you to tell me how much this bowling ball weighs, what would you do? You'd have to build something, wouldn't you? That's right. Because everything that we build down here is meant in a low earth gravity. So all of the hinges, all of the arms, all the motors, all the, the, the torque in the motors was designed for a low gravity environment. So if you don't build these systems that offload the weight into a zero G system, you'll break it, right? You'll over torque it. And so that's why it costs so much because you're trying to test something that's meant to be in space. So if you're trying to build something in space that's meant to come down to earth, it'll be the opposite, right? Like I said, think about that. How would you measure the bowling ball in space? All right, so shipping options, we talked about this, sea, air, or land, doesn't matter. We'll go anywhere, we'll do anything that's, that's required. Um, we have a shipping department that works with the Air Force. Um, we did a trial run on, on uh, the Air Force C-5, and we put in a container that was a little too heavy. We cracked one of the rollers. Um, the loadmaster got upset with us. He said, get that container off and they flew off. And so, <laughs> yeah, we didn't quite coordinate too well with, <laughs> in terms of knowing what the weight was. 
And so, like I said, we have to make sure we know who we're talking to and what they're doing. Because remember, this is a national asset, the C5A, and we just broke a national asset. Okay. And so we all think we're priority one, but we're not. So we have to make sure we work with them and we understand what their priorities are so that we have a good working relationship. Um, on C, like James Webb went on a barge through the Panama Canal. They asked for who, who wanted to go with it. Nobody raised their hands except for the former Navy guys. So no one's like, no, nah, we're flying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're going on C, dude. <laughs> Navy guys like, we'll do it. So we'll go anywhere and we'll do anything. So payload processing, once we get there and everything, we have to go and process this thing before we put it on the rocket. So what does that entail? So once everybody gets there, we have advanced teams that go, you know, weeks early and start setting up the factory before the vehicle gets there. Um, this picture right here, you can see this one's on truck. This is the one that actually hit the side of the guardrail. So that's that's that guy. But anyways, but you'll see you'll you'll see that. Offsite setup is crucial before we get there in terms of efficiency. So vehicle processing operations. Um, this is just minute like mini testing to make sure nothing damaged got damaged along the way, right? During transportation. Ooh. Oh, there we go. Making sure nothing got damaged along the way, make sure the environmental controls are there, making sure that um, the shock wasn't too much go. So we have shock recorders throughout this thing. Um, also, people don't understand like the containers themselves are designed to a certain pressure because if we drive up over the mountains, right, we don't want to have too much pressure in there. So we have about the, that blow out after a certain pressure, you know, that the container reaches. So there's there's a lot of cost that kind of rolls up into into building a satellite. Red tag, green tag operations. Uh, this, this, this one. The customer is going to be all over you. So will the company. If you leave something on there, something's not going to work. I won't mention what we did, but we did forget something. <laughs> we left something on there that wasn't supposed to be on there. And I would have to say it's a fault all the way along the chain because when they built that cover, they built it like the MLI. They used the MLI, the flight MLI, which they should, because we didn't know if it was flight or not, and they didn't label it as such. And it was so small, we left it on there. Again, knowing what your product is when you deliver something or when something gets delivered to you, that's very important, right? Same way you look at it. When you buy a car, you want to make sure you got everything you bought, right? You expect it and so on and so forth. So that's the same thing for red tag, green tag um, operations. Flight, install flight clamp band. This is where um, we we do it. We generally do a test at the factory before we come here, but this is for the, the final flight install. So we put the clamp band on. That's essentially what ties the vehicle to the rocket. That's what separates it, the separation band. And has it failed before? It has. I can't say for what program, but it has, okay? And what happened? Stuck to the rocket, burnt up in the atmosphere as it came back down. Dead on arrival. Okay, because of that. So very important. Fueling operations. Um, I've had the opportunity to do fueling operations one time. Uh, nasty stuff. Uh, high you are literally in those suits for hours and hours and hours on end. So you make sure you go to the restroom, you climb into that thing, all right? You're pressurizing, you're fueling it, so on and so forth. If anything happens, like if you're on the, the um, launch scrub team and you have to defuel, you're back in there again and defueling it out and putting it back in whenever you're ready to launch. Who's responsible for this operation? It depends. Um, we used to do a lot of it ourselves, and we still kind of do some of that, at least Northrop does. But Lockheed has fueling operation teams at a lot of these facilities that if we want, we can contract out for them to do it. 
right? Sometimes a customer wants them to do it. So it depends on, on what the, what the um, proposal and contract says. Encapsulation and transport. So once everything is ready to go, we begin encapsulation. All, it's almost done and ready to go, 99%. So the rocket guys come in, encapsulate it vertically. Um, the uh, uh, SpaceX guys does it horizontally, so it depends on who your provider is. Truck it out. We lift it up, put it onto the fairing. I mean, we lift up the fairing. We put it on top of the rocket, which is what you see here. On the left side is lift, lifting up. And on the right side is mounting on top of the rocket itself. Uh, launch dry runs. So everything you saw before was mechanical and electrical teams. These launch dry runs are primarily the electrical team. So they're in their control rooms along with the launch control teams, um, the rocket guys, the payload guys, and everybody. And they're sitting in there and they're checking all what needs to go. They're getting the right telemetry, making sure everybody calls go, no go. Everybody knows what the steps are. Okay. So that's what launch dry runs. If you have any issues, this is the time to hurry up and fix them. This is it. So final vehicle operations on a pad. When I said 99%, this is the last remaining 1%. Okay. Ordnance engineers, they go in and they go in and they take out the IFJs, in-flight jumpers, okay? So that's the last thing that prevents us from accidentally firing that clamp band, right? So we take those out, we make it flight, and then it's ready to go from our from a payload perspective. Now the whole thing becomes a payload to the rocket, right? So then quality does their final inspection. Everything that goes in there, must come out. Everything you take up there gets detailed on a log. You come out, everything gets checked out on that log. If you're missing something, which we have, we've lost a flashlight. One of our contamination engineers lost a flashlight and he couldn't find a toolbox coming back down. We stood down. We found it in one of the guys' toolbox. It didn't say anything. Put it in his toolbox. We lost two days. And fought. We would have found that's it. And we could have gone. But he didn't say anything. So I said, very, very important of what goes on in there. Any final uh, discrepancies, remaining paperwork must be closed out at this time. Uh, this is where the customer is going to work with. Yeah, um, our quality guys and our system engineers to make sure everything is final inspection and everything is closed out and ready to go. Oh, there we go. So, yeah, okay. So, launch day is is very high stress for everybody. If you miss a long, somebody else gets delayed behind, you get bumped later on until they can serial at this point and uh, that launch pad. You, then you need to have your recycle teams go in, secure everything. And I'll give you an example the only mechanical test engineer at the time. Um, we scrubbed three times and the launch was at 3.30 hours of sleep because we kept scrubbing. By the third day, I didn't care anymore. Go, no go, I don't care. I'm just gonna go take up in the corner. It was like 3.30 in the morning, dark. And what we do during this time is a game we call launch chicken. Anybody heard about that one? So what we do here is that you got the rocket guys and you got the payload guys. Everybody's got problems. No one's going to admit it. Okay. So we launch. We cut down. T minus three, T minus two, whatever. 
until somebody yells uncle. Whoever says I got a problem pays for the delay. So nobody wants to say anything, right? So for like the one that I had to recycle three times, we cried first, Our, we have a problem, but we know the rocket guys have a problem too. So, all right, all right. so the second time, they didn't fix it. We know they didn't fix it. All right, we're just gonna wait, no wait. So they finally fessed up the third time. The third time, nobody cared, we're like, nope, we're not saying anything. We're not incurring any more costs. Just cross your fingers and fire it off. And it went successfully, but that's our game of launch chicken, right? When, when we play, uh, you know, with the rockets here. Um, Post-launch operations, including monitoring in the control room, like I said, once it goes up, we have to make sure everything separates. We have to make sure we telemetry. If it doesn't separate, like I told you that story before, everybody turns around and looks at that group. <laughs> Mechanical guys, what happened? We'll get back to you on that. <laughs> you quickly get out of that room and find an answer for them. So that's launch day. That, so that's what I have. Nine o'clock. All right. Fantastic. We're, we're right there. <laughs> uh, sorry, this is a bit of a whirlwind. Like I said, we can talk about each subject. You know, I got many, many stories and you know, we can spend many, many days on it, but that's, that's kind of satellites in a nutshell uh, and integration in a nutshell, not so much proposals or all that. I left, I left the boring stuff out. But if you want to hear about it, we can talk about that too. <laughs> Any questions? I don't know how much detail you can go into, but like, what's kind of like the favorite project or like the favorite point like yeah in your career that of something you've worked on in space uh I, I would say one of the most interesting programs i worked on is l cross uh, so when we crash into the moon to look for water and i always tell people look we're the first person to do a bombing run on our moon twice we crash into there twice once with the vehicle and once with the upper stage of the rocket to look for water we did find a lot of water. Um, and the reason why I like that one is because I was kind of let loose. It was a small satellite. Nobody really wanted it. They didn't believe we can get it done. So I took that challenge. We got it done on time, under budget, and we showed the company that we can build small sat satellites fast. And they gave us, I had to integrate brand new uh, electronic uh, instruction system. They asked us to pilot all this stuff too at the same time, trying to cut out all the processes that we don't need for like a, it was a class C satellite. So it was a lower level satellite. So they kind of let us loose. And the customer was fantastic for Ames, NASA Ames. And the customers were great because they came down. They told us, look, we don't build vehicles. We don't know how to build space vehicles. We're experts. You tell us, we'll clear the red tape for you. Like, wait, did we hear that correctly? We've never heard that before. <laughs> they said, yep, we'll clear the red tape for you. You tell us what you need and we'll get it done. Fantastic. That's why I like that program. <laughs> Most everybody else, if you're working for like Goddard or somebody, they just pile requirements on top of requirements and they want more stuff done and then they, they want it free. And then they wonder why it costs so much. So requirements you put on us that we generally don't want to do. We don't think it needs to be done, but they pile that on top. That's for another discussion to, <laughs> in terms of requirements from a proposal standpoint. Any other? So in terms of the lean principles and MBSC of like automobile industry, how they're pretty fast at manufacturing and building and sending out their campaigns, right? Yes. So I know that aerospace, especially the space industry is a little behind just because of the, the legacy programs, equipment, or maybe just a particular equipment that they make. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of that, like what is your perspective now, maybe with experience, right? of how that trajectory is going to be like more inclined to change in, in this industry? Uh, it's growing exponentially. 
and it will continue to grow exponentially, at least in my view. Uh, the reason why it hasn't been is because it it was essentially kind of cordoned off by the people with the biggest wallets, and those are generally the government, right? And so that's why, you know, for many decades, it's been kind of a, a small subset of people that can really play in, in this sandbox. But as we get more into space and we commercialize it, then you start to see a lot more satellites come out like Starlink, right? That's a production powerhouse now. It's just cranking out satellites, right? If one goes down, it doesn't matter. The next one just takes its place. That one goes back to be recycled and so on and so forth, right? And so Starlink and uh, anything else that you decide to want to do, like commercial mining and so on and so forth, it requires a whole slew of satellites, then we will build that kind of production facility. Right. I mean, from a small scale production facility, I mean, like Boeing, right? Boeing is probably the closest in terms of a larger scale production facility. Smaller companies have smaller ones, like Millennium was one of those other ones that have one of the smaller production facilities for like smaller sats. But Boeing is is historically known as the only one that has a higher level production, right? Or high volume production. Northrop Grumman is known as you want production, don't go to those guys because they're extremely expensive. But if you want flagship vehicles like um, James Webb or anything like that, you go to Northrop. All right. So it, it, it's going to continue to grow. All right. That's my view, at least, on it. Anybody else? Okay, that's all I have then. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Dennis, for the talk. I think that was awesome, honestly. It's really cool information. And uh, thanks everyone else for joining in online and in person. Um, I don't know, do you want to plug the any of the events coming up, Ken? Oh. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, good idea. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, after today, uh, this we have this uh, NASA AMS uh, talk by Dr. Swati Sasena. It's about NASA AMS, uh, new effort on digital uh, air control, air traffic control. So, actually, the air traffic control and the space traffic control are very hot topic right now. So in case you didn't know, there are actually a lot of new business coming in, in town. For example, in Long Beach here, there's a spin launch. Uh, then we have a uh, scene shot that looks, sounds very similar. Scene shot in El Segundo, scene shot is for space traffic management. Uh, but NASA is looking for the air traffic management and the digitalization of the traffic control. Uh, so Dr. Sasena is going to tell us uh, a great story. So please join us, it's online. But we also have an uh, in-person meeting in Longdale, uh, so please join us. And then, actually, next Saturday, uh, that's for this Saturday for NASA AMS. Uh, for next Saturday, we actually got a <clears throat> good offer. Uh, it's a K-12 event, but it's very exciting. Uh, you know the Da Vinci School uh, in in um, El Segundo, right next to Air Force Base. Uh, and uh, Millennium Space System, Aerospace Corporation in that corner, there's a wonderful public school, charter school called the uh, Da Vinci, Da Vinci School. Uh, they offer us to uh, have this meeting, uh, cater educator meetings there. Then they will have the director give a, in, some kind of introduction and the, their robotic team will do some demo. It's very exciting. Uh, then, uh, and also we have uh, five um, talks from France. So we have a member, uh, he's like a teacher there. Uh, he's actually, it's like a mentorship. Uh, he mentors several uh, students. Uh, it's not young professional, but it's kind of, those students are great. If Europe is a little bit different, you know, they have five, the fifth year, so it kind of say my kind of practice, apprentice school, or something. so it's like a young professional. So five groups going to talk about using the tidal force uh, between moon and earth as a propulsion. Uh, and also the electric uh, 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 kind of clean energy, you know, those uh, those kind of thing, uh, the Tchaikovsky type of propulsion. So it's very interesting topic. Please join us. And after the event, 
Uh, I don't know if you heard about uh, the congressman representative Ted Liu. Uh, he was actually from Air Force. He's our member, but he's now a congressman. Uh, he is in charge of El, El Segundo area, so folks in Segundo you need to know him. And his office is running, uh, uh, it's called a Service Acam Academy Day. Uh, I, I, it is for like, a, you know, you have service family, then you, you have student, you know, student or uh, in support of this uh, K-12 or Air Force uh, people, family, children study K-12. It's called a Service Academy Day. So it's right after our event uh, in the same place. So if you join us in person, you will be able to uh, enjoy both, but you can welcome to join online as well. So that's the one. And uh, that's January 28th. On, January, uh, on February 6th is a very hot topic right now is personalized aviation. So we are going to have this called the uh, frontier for air mobility, air mobility. So if you look at our flyer, uh, it's very fancy. Uh, uh, some guy dressed like a Star Wars uh, thing and the uh, uh, flying, you know, uh, I don't know how to call it, flying bike or it actually is uh, it's a larger drone. It's kind of in the middle. It's a big drone. Uh, but you, you, a person can sit on it, like you're riding a bicycle. So, so air mobility is tied up to a very important thing for AIWA, like sustainable aviation, electric electric high, hybrid aircraft, and flying cars. But for course, for us, I was just joking with uh, Courtney, for AIWA aviation people, we don't want to call it flying car, because the car people want to steal this project as theirs. So they call it flying car, they don't want to brand it as aircraft. Because if you say aircraft, then that's AWA, it's aviation. But you say car, flying car, that's automobile. So there's a big fight here. But we call it, you know, a sustainable aviation or electric hybrid aircraft. But it, it, it's kind of fun. And this CEO, uh, the star company, they actually, if you uh, look at the flyer, it's not just the hardware itself. It is also like a digital highway because you're flying this thing, you, you, you have need very good traffic control. So you're probably highly connected to network, you know, IoT, uh, traffic control thing. And actually, Curtin, you pointed out, for this kind of personal aviation or jetpack uh, or uh, this kind of air bike, or air mobility, the technology is probably not the uh, throttle or the limiting factor, it's probably the policy, you know, safety, FAA, those kind of things. But it's going to be fun you know, the future aviation. And if you, in case you didn't know, actually in the LA is a very, interesting underlying effort going is called the future city and uh, we are trying to work on it and the uh, usc is tying with this and we have dr bradley leading uh this effort is that uh, we're going to a couple events you have you know like a futuristic type of city like la and but potentially it could be mars or on the moon you know those kind of thing um well since they can design the helicopter for mars maybe you can have the air bike you know, saying, you know, for Mars and the moon, I don't know, but it, you know, Mars probably. So it's, it's kind of interesting. So that's February 6th. It's online presentation, but we are going to do hybrid in uh, Willowbrook Library. And uh, there were a couple events coming up, but the next one we are going to say is the March 11 uh, student branch mini conference. Uh, it, it, it's very exciting. And we have a keynote speaker from Lucky Martin. Uh, he is the inventor for the VTOL engine for F-35, Dr. Paul, uh, Paul Belalacqua. Uh, in case you didn't know Belalacqua, if you read Romeo and the Juliet, there's a family, royal noble family called Belalacqua, and he is from that, his name is the same for Romeo and Juliet family. Actually, I can tell you, interesting, if you read Romeo and Juliet, there's actually a family called T-Boat. If you remember that, actually, we have a member, his name has name, happened to be T-Boat. So it's kind of interesting, but that's a side way. But March 11, uh, Dr. Um, Paul Belaracqua is going to talk about Skunk Works and F-35 and the invention process of the VTOL engine. Uh, so you go, and then we also have Dr. Lahu Benamin from Aerospace Corporation going to talk about Aerospace Corporation and the planetary defense. And Dennis, again, uh, he will uh, try to help a student, but it, it's not exactly the same talk, but you're talking uh, the, the control, you know, the uh, issue command control, uh, the, the satellite control, you know, those kind of things. Um, but the main thing is like today is to help the student. But of course, later on, we'll uh, arrange for professional talk, public talk. So uh, that is not like this, you know, uh, 
a mentorship type of thing is more for the general public. Uh, so that's the current uh, thing we have, but we are working on um, a very exciting um, awards. You know, there, there might be a couple of events like space architecture, and actually uh, a gentleman supposed to show up today from Virgin Galactic, but he just texts me he has to work. He's our former membership chair, and uh, uh, he, he used to work in Boeing, is now working in uh, Virgin uh, Galactic. So I'm working with him and some other people uh, for a new space mini conference that's coming up. For May 11, uh, too long. <laughs> oh, I'm just trying to share your excitement because the awards, you know, we are trying to give awards to students doing very good jobs. We actually think about creating young professional awards. Actually, I mentioned to you, uh, you can think about it, depending on the budget, those things. So as to encourage young professional doing great jobs, uh, those kind of thing, and uh, who or who people like Dennis, you know, or uh, can support uh, the YP effort. Uh, those kind of thing, uh, but we are going to we are considering our council is considering to giving a word to Artemis, you know, because every year we give a word to a company or group doing excellent jobs. Last year we already gave the award to uh, James Webb Telescope. Uh, so we have a uh, director of James Webb Space Telescope Engineering and the Science give a short talk and we give them awards. But it was launched in 2001, so literally we should not get it again, even though it's big pictures, still, uh, beautiful pictures still coming up. And they claim that they have reversed the physics of, of the universe, revolutionized. So, uh, but anyway, uh, that's last year. Uh, then another possibility is the DART mission, which is very exciting. And we are actually working on a DART mission event, but it's more, we have been working with Aerospace Corporation, uh, we have been waiting for several months since June because uh, uh, we have been want, trying to do a DART event, professional event, but now we are getting to a, 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 a STEM education event. We are going to do it uh, in February with a, a, a private library people, aerospace corporation people in Downey, uh, Columbia Memorial Center, but that's more a family union. It's not very professional, uh, but it's fun to inspire the uh, next generation. Um, but we are going to have a professional event on DART. Uh, so, but APL literally is, is in Maryland. So it's not within our section in, in LA. So we decided to look into some contributor like uh, LJ Rocketdyne. I, I heard North Oklahoma seems to have some comp contribution, but LJ Rocketdyne seems to be very big, especially the RS-25 engine. Although some people complain, you know, it's the oral constellation and space but. Uh, we, we are trying to get in touch with those people and uh, they will kind of give a talk about Artemis. So things are coming up. So uh, stay in touch, you know, network and uh, uh, we are more exciting things coming up. We are very interesting people. We are trying to connect. Uh, I cannot immediately try to uh, point out uh, many people, but we do have a lot of very, uh, very in interesting people. I'll try to explain to uh, Courtney that uh, um, you name it. We we have. If you are more uh, uh, like a woman, you know, support woman. Uh, we have many great women. Like I just mentioned, uh, we have several women uh, uh, AWS fellow in this area. Uh, on UCLA Propulsion Lab director. Then we have Mary Lee Wheaton, uh, Aerospace Corporation, very big. And uh, we also have uh, actually a, a fellow in Empire. In case you are interested in like uh, <clears throat> electric hybrid aircraft, there is a big company called Ampere doing very good jobs. Uh, they have big uh, news press near Hudson Airport, and people didn't realize. <clears throat> so we have a lot of people. So for example, you name it, each company you can find our member in leadership or grassroots. So that's why I want to encourage you to connect to us, also especially with Courtney. So uh, please share information with her and uh, we are going to uh, graduate at uh, um, young professional in, in the community. And uh, we have people like uh, 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 Professor Sher Shelley online. And uh, we actually have a couple of people, unfortunately they cannot make it uh, from uh, Armstrong, NASA Armstrong. And uh, a couple of people, they are very interested in this. It just didn't was not able to make it today, uh, but they are very interested. So uh, please stay with us, and uh, we are going to help you for your career. And I know I know Bear want to become the leader uh, of the uh, you know, the you know the the community. You know, so uh, this is the group you want to stay for for of you too. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for very much for joining us today. Uh, so. Uh, 
please make sure if you join the membership, um, if you haven't done so, uh, uh, it, uh, the 50% discount. That's a great incentive. OK, uh, thank you, to again. Courtney is really very good, so please try to connect with her, stay in touch, and uh, uh, also, of course, connect to our group. Thank you very much. Um, anybody want, online want to say something? Uh, I guess let me. It's just good to see you all tonight. Um, very good presentation. Thank you, Dennis. Um, and yeah, we'll we uh, just encourage you so, all to to get involved and stay involved. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jelly. It's a really important for you to join us to help us. Oh, you you muted too. Okay. So I guess uh, uh, I think it's over nine o'clock. So um, uh, so if, if anybody wants to say anything, you, you go ahead online. Uh, otherwise, we'll wrap up here. Uh, so we are, uh, uh, you know, people might hang around here a little bit longer, uh, but we'll start to wrap up. Uh, so thank you for my, very much for joining us. Uh, so stay in touch. And uh, this is the, I cannot say beginning because actually we have been doing young professional uh, event, but we are trying to connect to say the Long Beach and the El Segundo South Bay community uh, more. And we are trying to find different ways uh, to to connect you, 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 you people and uh, deliver uh, the help uh, you need for young professional. So personalized and also group group rights. So that's what we try to do. So um, uh, uh, we, are, we are trying to uh, continue this great effort. Yeah. So, OK, thank you very much. So you welcome to stay a little bit longer. If you want to order something more, please go ahead. Uh, order something more like cakes, you know, uh, something like that or drinks and uh, uh, chat with the speaker and Courtney uh, or each other. That would be great. OK, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.